it is such a privilege to come into your home. And it's a privilege to open the Word of God. Sissy last week was going over the, the camera and I was amazed that the only difference you see in me is the color of the shirt. The Bible. Now, I wish I had a little bit more southern to get that baritone. Butch needs to say it. The Bible. God's work is always right here. Reverend Berta Wilhelm, my mentor growing up and a dear, dear friend, said, Donnie, always speak from the Bible. Don't get involved in civil affairs in the pulpit. What a great teaching. It's hard. It's hard not to, but and you can filter some in, but you don't stay there very long. You stay on the Word of God. The scripture today is found in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. Now, give you just a little bit of background and it helps to know where Paul, the writer of Ephesians, and the reason behind Paul loved the Word of God. He didn't know this. Any believer of any time at all knows that he, he met Jesus one day and what a difference it made in his life. But in Acts chapter 20, Luke's given a, a breakdown of the early church, which Acts just means the Acts of the Apostles. And Paul spent three years with the Ephesian church in Ephesus. And right before he left, he, he gave them some wonderful teachings. I think it's in Acts chapter 20 somewhere. But he says, I've spent three years with you teaching the Word of God to you diligently. And I'm about to leave, but when I leave, and Paul uses the word, savage wolves will come in in the midst of you. And they'll try to persuade you from the truth of a living God. And they'll want you to go their ways. Hold firm to the truth, my brother, of what you've been taught. And then he made his ways to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, Paul was, I guess, sidetracked for just a moment. Not because of his dealing, but because some Judaizer had started a riot. And they blamed it on Paul. And they tried to kill him, and a soldier was said, they're trying to kill somebody. So he went and seen it was Paul, and when they seen the soldier there, they stopped and the soldier put Paul in prison for two years in Jerusalem. And then Paul finally appealed to Caesar. And the same one said, don't worry about it, we'll kill him on the way out of Jerusalem. So the soldier took 2,250 men and escorted Paul out of Jerusalem by night. He took him to Rome. Of course, you know the story of going to Rome, the shipwrecks. And Paul had been in Rome now, in prison for two years. And word got back to him that the Ephesian church, the wolves had arrived. And they was teaching the wrong word of God. And they began to persuade some of the Ephesians to filter away from what Paul calls and teaches is the truth 
of the living word. So this is a letter that he wrote to the church while he was in prison. One of the last letters. Of course, Timothy's the last letter he wrote. But, this, but that's the reason for this letter. That they began to filter away from the truth. Ephesians 4, 17-24. Living as children of light. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the fertility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to their hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensualities as in to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continuous lust for more. You, however, do not come to know, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind, and to put on the new self, Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, what precious words again has been preserved down through the centuries. Once more this morning, Lord, I just pray that thou would open each one of our minds and our heart, Lord, and may the Holy Spirit Intercede, Lord, on the very word of a living God. Intercede for you, Lord. And just, Lord, where we don't understand, may the Holy Spirit just speak to our souls. And Lord, may I now, in my weakness, be a servant for a living God. Powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Last week I left us off as I began to speak about the holiness of God and how many times in life it's uh, it's fate. Hasn't heard it for a while, but. You know, back growing up, I heard the thing, even from, from Christians saying, well, if you don't feel it, just fake it. That's a disgrace to a living God. And most of us, if you've lived a life for very long, it doesn't matter if your age or, or where you are in your life, whether you're Christian, non-Christian, rich, young, poor, white, black, Sooner or later, you're going to have a crisis in your life, whatever that crisis might be. And most of the time, not always, when that crisis gets deep enough or strong enough, there's a crisis that, almost like a magnet that is drawing us back to God in a crisis. But here's where the problem comes in. We're drawn back to meeting with God as a casual event. I've seen signs on churches, come as you are. I guess you could take that in many ways. Could mean it clothes. Could mean where you are. And I'm not speaking on clothes. Not what I'm speaking at. When we come to meet God. 
We need to come before Him knowing that He's a holy God. And you don't just not show up, walk into the presence of God and say, Hey God, what's up? That's what was happening. They began to bring God down upon their level, these savage wolves that Paul calls them. And they began to compare the living God with all the false gods. And Paul says, no, you must put off. Stop comparing him. So knowing a holy God, first of all, starts with terror. I mean, there has to be a godly, holy fear within us. But how does God show that holy fear? Remember last week, I shared for us what the dictionary says about the divide or set apart. But His holiness, and I left off last week, and is shown by people. People that know God. Remember David and Joshua? Remember Joshua as he, Moses has, has now died. He crossed over the Jordan River. And Moses is in fear, but God told him three times, don't fear. Be of good courage. So Joshua, on the night before, they was to go to Jericho, and he and he went out and he seen this angel of light that's found in Joshua 5, 13 through 15. And this angel of the soldier of the living God. And Joshua says, are you for us or for our enemies? And he says, neither. Remember, he asked the wrong question. It's not about whether God is for us or for our enemies. That's not the question. The question is, are we for God? And then the next thing, the angel of the army of hosts tells Joshua. Now remember, they're in a heathen territory. And the angel says in Joshua 5, take off your shoes, just as he told Moses. For the place you are standing is holy ground. You see that when we come before a holy God, it's not that the place becomes holy. It's the environment that becomes holy. That's exactly what Isaiah felt and saw as he looked down upon heaven. It's the same thing that John the Revelator saw as he looked down and the angels were singing, holy, holy, holy. But there's a moment of truth in everyone's life when we're in this crisis and we want out of the crisis. Been there. But we'll never be out of the crisis. Doesn't matter how much you believe in God. Doesn't say, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about lifting up the glory of a holy God. Now when you lift him up high enough, the crisis will still be there. But you'll look through that crisis and there you'll see God through the eyes of Jesus. There's more at stake than just, and I'm not making light of problems around the world today. I'm not making light of COVID-19, not making light of schools and colleges and everything that's going on. But the what the Bible is teaching and what the Apostle Paul is teaching. There is a hardening of hearts that will never be softened until they see the holiness of a living God. So as we go throughout life, There has to be that moment when that misconception about God, 
when our hearts become softened and we begin to truly know the holiness of the Holy God. We can't play games. Remember, we can't play the if only game. So God shows himself through people. He also shows himself through places. I want to take just a moment in a chapter that I, I ain't going to say it's my favorite, but it's Leviticus. And there's got to be something the matter with me to even know Leviticus. But it's a chapter about order. It's you don't walk in to the pulpit or walk into your classroom without first being prepared. Around our house, when the family's all in, I'm telling you, it's total chaos. Until dinner time. Chaos stops because everyone knows what's coming. Somebody's praying. You see, God doesn't care that we have fun. Doesn't care as long as it doesn't be good with Him. But there are places of holiness that He does care. Let me take you just for a moment to Leviticus. I think it's Leviticus. Let me sing the song here. <laughs> Leviticus 20. Leviticus 10. And give you just a little bit of background. At that time, they was in the wilderness. And they was a tent for a Walls set up, 120 feet by 75 feet. That was the outer walls. And on those outer walls was curtains that was hung. And then on the outside of these curtains was an altar. And that was for the people to burn or for the priest to burn each day. And the fire was to never go out. But then every morning they would take fire from this outside altar, and then the inside of the altar, there was a tent. And the tent was split up into two. It had a holy place, then it had a holy, a holy place. That was the atonement. And only once a year could a priest go behind the curtain of that second tent. And Aaron's two oldest sons one day got drunk. And their job was to take fire out of the first ceremonial altar, take the ashes from it, take it to the other altar, clean it, and start the fire in that altar. Every morning, that was their job. So one morning, they was a little under the influence. And they just took fire from a campfire nearby instead of from the altar. Listen to what happened. Aaron's son, Nadad and Abigail, took their censers, that's what they carried the fire in, and put fire in them and added incense, not from the altar. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord contrary to his command. So fire came down from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then told Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke with me. And he said, you shall not mourn. You see, there's some places in the word of God that God said, that's holy. And it'll remain open. That's why God has given unto us His Word. All of God's laws reflect His holiness. 
it's easy to skip over Leviticus. It's easy to just kind of bounce around and pick and choose, but do you know the first four commandments of the Ten Commandments, which is found in Exodus 20? The first four of them deals precisely with holiness. You shall have no other gods before me, for I am holy. And the fourth one is one that I have my blood, and I've only been mad twice in my life. But I come really close when I hear someone using my God's name. All the law reflects His holiness. I pray today that when we're going through that crisis in life, that we begin to see the holiness of God. We might not understand why we're in it. But God reveals His holiness that we might treat it with the greatest humility the side of heaven. Holiness is revealed through his prophets of the old. Do you know what idolatry is? Most of us know. Having another God. Well, idolatry is really spiritual adultery. You're selling yourself to another God. Now, they don't have to be a god of stone, as in the wilderness, a god of gold made for a golden calf. That's why it's so important that you and I keep the God of heaven, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. We need to know that that God, your God, my God, and the holier we keep him, the less we see of ourselves. And we, the Old Testament prophets, they had a job, but most of the time, their job was dealing with them. <coughs> spiritual idolatry. Daniel chapter 5. Remember Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belteshazzar, thought he could just walk all over the God of Daniel, most of you know the story, he threw a big party and it was like a quarter mile long building and flowers was everywhere and the goblets and finally in a drunken stupor he said, bring in the goblets that my father brought back from Jerusalem. And they brought him in and they was drinking wine out of the goblets and, and there was a handwriting on the wall called Daniel in. What's that mean? Daniel says it means you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And tonight, God will take your life. And that's the way it happened. You see, he walked over the holiness of God until we as God's people, we as Americans, we as a nation, we as a world, come to understand God's holiness. You can't appreciate His grace. And that's why I say so many times, in so many circumstances, John Newton finally got it when he looked in the belly of that ship and saw the filth of what he was carrying. But he looked through it, and he saw a holy God. <clears throat> That's what we need to see first. Do we really appreciate it? And, and God poured upon my heart this week. My son, holiness of my son upon the cross. And for
for a while, he became sin. If you don't think holiness matters, ask Ananias and Sapphira. Try to pull one over God, someone they could fool of faith. You see, they chose to step outside the boundaries of a holy God. Everything around us loses its value when we lift up a holy God. Everything. Remember the book I share with you once in a while about walking in the dust of Rabbi Jesus? Beautiful book, hard to read. I persevered, made it through. Man, I'm glad I did. One word in that book was worth the trial. And that word was supersede. Jesus supersedes everything. Do you know why? He can calm the sea. His word supersedes the storms. Do you know why he can heal on the Sabbath? His power supersedes the law. Do you know why you have grace? His word at the cross supersedes. that they're covered, and we do use that word, and then it's true because the Bible says it. But it says the Old Testament it was fulfilled. Jesus shows forth the holiness of a holy God on the cross. You see, his father's reputation was at stake. And for a while, Jesus became sin. Didn't lose his deity. But he put upon himself. And God's holiness left him. Because God could not look at sin in his son. In my church, my friends, troubles will come. Let the holiness of God supersede every strife in your life. And there, you will glorify God. And in glorifying Him, you will find you are in the presence of a holy God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you, our Lord, for remaining true to who you are. Thank you for never changing. We don't have to look, Lord. You're right where you've always been. Lord, today I pray for each one in the sound of my voice has forgotten or maybe slid from searching your holiness to the Lord to just a salad bar mentality. Taking Jesus. So Lord this morning, may we as a body, may we as a church, just lift high and magnify through Jesus, our Savior, your holiness. Your honor and your glory. His precious name we pray.